looks like people is pouring in. There was a long line for coffee. Yeah, that's true. You're gonna sit in that area? Yeah, close right to Maxi. Okay, if I, you know, I will shake my arms like crazy. Yeah. Normally, I try to do eye contact. Yeah, sometimes no, I'll, it, I'll look in your direction. Yeah, when I when I talk, I also I kind of yes, I, I swipe uh, across. So. I okay, I think it's enough. Thirty-two, sir. Okay. Hello. So please welcome to the afternoon session. We start with uh, with two very exciting and, and very different talks, different expertises. Uh, so my name is Javier Borges, by the way. Um, <clears throat> now we start with uh, Filippo Mengzer. I think that for most of you is a very well-known name. Probably I wouldn't need to say anything, but just for the uh, traditions, let's say the long, long line of, of things that he participates in. So he's the Ludi Distinguished Professor of Informatics and Computer Science at the Indiana University. He's the director of the Observatory on Social Media and a member, former director of the Center for Complex Networks and Systems Research. Um, his activity spans from, I mean, he has uh, appointments in cognitive science, in physics, besides the computer science that I just mentioned. He serves on the advisory board of the uh, Indiana University Network Science Institute um, and many other things. Also, he is uh, part of the ISI Foundation in Torino uh, and a fellow of the ACM. I think that most of us, at least in my case, I, I knew uh, Filippo for the work that he was doing uh, with, at the awesome, the observatory on social media, the kind of work and applications and software that they have been releasing for the last years. I think uh, many of you probably know this morning we were talking about this in the social media session, uh, Botometer regarding the identification of bots uh, in online media, Hoxie about misinformation, disinformation, etc. And I think, and this is very personal, when I was preparing a little bit my presentation, I think that one of the things I admire most and I like best of uh, Phil and of many of you who are here is the capacity to make an impact, not only in his community or in the physics community or complex systems community, but actually to spread this impact where it is most difficult in other fields. So not only we can find his work in, let's say, multidisciplinary journals like science or, or nature communications, we can find it in nature human behavior, we can find it in physical review letters. And I think that this kind of uh, heterogeneity is what really makes a, a rich career and, and a super interesting profile. So please, Phil. Thank Thanks. you, thank you, thank you very much. Hi everybody, thank you Javier for the wonderful uh, introduction. Thank you, Jose, and the other organizers for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to finally be in front of friends and colleagues in person, the first uh, in-person conference for me after several years. And I also want to thank Springer to, uh, for sponsoring this complexity talk. So I'll talk about hacking online virality, and I will give an overview of the work that we do at the Observatory on Social Media at Indiana University. Uh, we call it awesome because we're awesome. And I'll start to show an example of the kind of objects that we study. This is a diffusion network. I'm sure I don't need to spend much time on it uh, for this audience. Uh, the nodes here represent accounts on Twitter, which is of course the platform that is easiest to study in terms of collecting data. The edges here represent retweets. And this is the diffusion of one particular piece of news. In fact, one particular piece of fake news is the article in InfoWars that is shown there. This was the most viral fake news article during the 2016 election. It was a false claim that the Clinton campaign was involved in, a, uh, in satanic rituals. It was a precursor of uh, Pizzagate, for those of you who remember Pizzagate, and later QAnon. But it did spread very virally, 
and uh, we can see that some nodes were particularly influential. You're not going to be surprised that those big nodes are the ones associated with InfoWars and Alex Jones, who's in the news in the last few days. Um, and we also see a bunch of other accounts a little bit closer to the periphery, but also quite influential. And they tend to be colored in red. So those are accounts probably controlled by the same entity. Those are probably all controlled by Alex Jones. And they were very effective at getting real people in blue exposed to this piece of misinformation. So that's one way in which the network can be hacked. So I'll be talking about that uh, quite, quite a bit. But first, let me say that this is not a typical case of a piece of misinformation. If you look at the distribution of popularity, <clears throat> both for fake news and for news from reliable sources, it looks like a very broad distribution as we are used to seeing in this community. The great majority of articles do not uh, go viral. They're only shared by a few people, but there is a long tail. So there is a bunch of articles that are shared by a surprisingly large number of people. This is true both for real news and for fake news, but the curve is even broader for fake news, which has brought some people to say that fake news you know, are more viral. So why? Why do we observe this kind of dynamics? So to kind of explore these questions, what are the key ingredients of virality? We develop a bunch of models at, 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 the, at our lab, at our center. These are simple agent-based models that try to capture some of the salient features of a social media ecosystem. For example, the fact that you have a screen and you have followers and friends, and when you post something new, your uh, followers see it, and then you see the things posted by, by your friends. Uh, so there is the structure of the network, which is one of these ingredients. Another ingredient is the fact that people only see some portion of the things that are posted by their Uh, people who are exposed, it doesn't matter. And on the y-axis, we see the average number of exposures to a piece of information before it is adopted, before somebody reshares it. So for the most viral memes, which is the very small minority, people will reshare it after having seen it even once. So this is just like simple contagion, right? Just like the spread of diseases. But the, for, for the majority of information, uh, the black curve here is the one that I would like you to look at. Uh, which is the empirical data, for the majority of information, 
you need to see something several times before you decide to reshare it. This is complex contagion, as I'm sure many of you uh, are familiar with. So what does this have to do with the structure of the network? Well, it turns out that the structure of the network, and in particular, the community structure of the network, the presence of many triangles, the presence of a high clustering coefficient favors this complex contagion in at least a couple of ways. One is social reinforcement, okay? Inside a community where you have lots of triangles, as soon as two people share the same information or one retweets another, now you have two people that have shared that piece of information, but because of the high number of triangles, many people are now being exposed not to one, but to two instances of that. Or if you wanna look at it from the algorithmic perspective, now the, the algorithm will see that a lot of people have two of their friends having shared something. And so then the algorithm will uh, amplify that. So the presence of lots of triangles makes it easier to reach some threshold of complex contagion. And the other ingredient, of course, is homophily. Inside a community, people tend to have similar opinions, similar ideas, so they're more likely to reshare something that they're exposed to from their friends inside the same community. So things are going to share faster inside a community of like-minded people. And when we look at political communities, for example, on Twitter, we find these very dense communities, which some people call echo chambers. Um, this is a picture of a retweet network of people sharing links to articles um, on Twitter. On top is the follower network, on the bottom is the diffusion network, In either so the retweet network. In either case, you can see that conservatives tend to follow and retweet other conservatives. Liberals tend to follow and retweet other liberals. And the size of the nodes here is the fraction, is proportional to the fraction of links shared by a user that are linking to low credibility sources. So bigger nodes are misinformation spreaders. And you can see that there are a lot of those big nodes among conservatives and among liberals. So we have these highly dense clustered communities with a lot of misinformation that spreads very quickly inside the community but they don't necessarily cross from one community to the other community. Because for the same reasons that things spread fast inside a community, they also kind of stay isolated from either communities because you don't have a lot of triangles that span across the two. So what is the role of social media in fostering, accelerating the emergence of these communities, segregated, polarized communities that can be exploited? Uh, to explore that question, we can also use a model, a very simple model, similar to the one that we saw before, but now you can assume that people also have uh, opinions. For simplicity, in this case, opinions are just one dimensional, uh, uh, just a number from left to right, from blue to red. And you can imagine that initially these are uniformly distributed. And there are two important ingredients here. One is social influence. If you're exposed to an idea that is superficially close to yours, you might change your idea a little bit to become more close to what you are seeing. And the second one is unfriending, which is a way to foster homophily. If you encounter somebody who's sharing something that you strongly disagree with, that you find objectionable, maybe offensive, you can unfollow them, okay? And in this model, in that case, we replace the edge with a completely random edge. So what happens here, the dashed lines are edges that are being cut and they replace with random edges, which are the solid lines. We can see that opinions start evolving because of influence. And at the beginning, we had all the different colors. And after a while, people are beginning to have ideas that kind of align around the two poles, the blue and the red. We have less diversity. But at the same time, people are sorting themselves out into these two groups. The structure is also changing because of the unfriending. And these two things work together and then we force each other. And so after a while, inevitably, under some, of course, parameter values that I'm not gonna bore you with, but there are different scenarios that you can explore with this model, but under some reasonable assumptions, you end up with two, in this case, completely segregated and completely homogeneous communities. The red people are only exposed to other 
ideas from other red people. The blue people are only exposed to ideas from other blue people. And each person is no longer, after a while, exposed to ideas from the other group, okay? So we have both segregation and, um, you know, homogeneity. And remember that this is only based on these two very simple assumptions of social influence and unfriending, which are common to virtually all social media platforms that we use. So, in fact, if, if you want to play with this model, there is, there is a link there, um, and you can run it and play with it, and you'll find that even a little, very little, non-zero uh, social influence probability and a very small non-zero unfollowing probability will lead to very quickly this scenario where you have both segregation and, um, and homogeneity. Those two things can happen to a limited extent if you only have social influence or you only have rewiring. But to get these kind of segregated homogeneous echo chambers, you need both ingredients. And in fact, even empirically, to see whether, in fact, an account is likely to find themselves in such homogeneous communities, uh, we run a bunch of experiments, we ran a bunch of bots. I won't tell you too many details, but if you're interested, Diogo Pacheco is presenting this paper on Friday. Um, and so these different bots were initialized by just following one account, a news source. Some of them started following left-leaning news sources like The Nation. Some of them started following right-leaning sources like Breitbart and somewhere in, in the middle. And after a while, almost all of these bots, even though they were doing pretty random things, posting, posting completely random things, retweeting random tweets, following random people, but just by virtue of interacting with other users on the platform, they tended to find themselves in these pretty homogeneous community. The ones that started on the left ended up in liberal communities. The ones that started on the right ended up in conservative communities. Um, here's a, a little bigger picture. The yellow dots here are the bots, is our bots. And here the, the colors represent political alignment of the different users that they were interacting with. And the size of the nodes represent the fraction of misinformation. So even though the bots found themselves in communities both liberal and conservative, they were exposed to more misinformation on the conservative side. And there, there is other work since then that has shown similar results of a conservative bias uh, on the platform. And we find that uh, on the x-axis, you see a measure of like how many triangles there are. And you see that both on the right and on the left, you have stronger clustering, but you have more, uh, a uh, higher likelihood of encountering and sharing low credibility information on the right. So you have these echo chambers on both sides, although um, you don't have symmetry. In fact, this is a different, different work uh, in which we study looked something similar. And we looked at the correlation between the conservatives versus liberal slant of uh, social media users based on what information they were sharing, what sources they were sharing and the correlation of that with uh, sharing low credibility sources. And you find that there is a correlation both on the right and on the left. So if you're more partisan, and if you're more inside an echo chamber, you're more likely to be exposed to misinformation, but it is not symmetric. The effect is stronger on the right. Okay, so how can you hack it? Here's one example. They're called follow trains. Some of you may remember follow Friday from Twitter from a few years ago it was pretty popular. You would say, hey, follow these people. Well, that mechanism can be abused. How? You can have a bunch of accounts that systematically mention other accounts. And then all the followers of those accounts, which we call uh, conductors, uh, start following the mentioned accounts that we call, that we call uh, writers. And in this way, you can basically artificially inflate the size and density of a political echo chamber. Uh, this is a mention network. You can find that it's quite hierarchical. At the core, you have these train conductors. They acquire a huge number of followers. And then the people that they mention also acquire a huge number of followers. It's all, it all happened inside a homogeneous community. So people just 
do uh, either automatically or manually follow everybody that is mentioned. This happens both on the right and on the left. This particular picture represents uh, the MAGA follow trains on the US conservative uh, side. And you can see that it works, okay? So uh, the top left plot shows the distribution of the average daily number of new friends. So the riders acquire a huge number of friends, uh, but uh, the conductors even more. And uh, you can see up to hundreds per day, hundreds of new followers per day. And, and these are new accounts as soon as the, 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 the riders, as soon as they are created. And this is significantly greater than a control group, which was made by active uh, political accounts that were not engaging in these follow trains. Um, you can see on the bottom left that these accounts are playing a game. So where does this come from? It comes from the fact that the platform is trying to discourage fake followers. Uh, so what do they do? They say, if you, you cannot follow more than 5,000, this is for Twitter, you cannot follow more than 5,000 accounts unless you have more than 5,000 followers. And so this game is how you beat that. You uh, collude with others. You say, you follow me, I follow you. So I get above 5,000 you get above 5,000, we all get above 5,000. And so you can notice that because the ratio of number of followers to number of friends is very narrowly distributed around one. So in many of these cases, you will see that it's exactly one. As soon as they get more followers, they can follow more people. And the effect is huge. On the right, on that log-log correlation plot, you see the number of new daily followers acquired by a writer account before and after they are mentioned in a train tweet. The median of the increase is 600%. Okay? So you can increase your number of daily followers by around 600% just by playing this game. So this is one way in which you can basically hack the community structure because you are building a bigger and denser echo chamber. And in that community, you can spread information that is aligned with the opinions of that community very, very effectively. Okay, so the other ingredient that I mentioned is engagement. The fact that we have finite attention and both people and algorithms pay attention to engagement and can be tricked. So in the model that I showed you earlier, where I showed you that you, you would have this long tail in the distribution of uh, virality, no matter what, there was no notion of quality, right? Some, some things were going to go viral for no particular reason. So what if you add an ingredient to the model where you say, okay, now each piece of information has some quality associated with it. This is the model I get to make up this number, maybe a number distributed between zero and one. And we assume that the agents can see that quality and that among the things that they see on their screen, the probability that they will reshare something is proportional to that quality, okay? So if something is twice as high quality, it's twice as likely that I will retweet it, but only among the things that I see. So in this case, you would expect that yes, if some things go viral, probably they are the ones with higher quality. And yes, you do observe that in some situations. So on the left, you see that kind of situation. The size of the nodes here is the quality of the information shared by the different accounts. So you see those are kind of big fat nodes. That's good. Most agents are sharing high quality information, but that's a situation in which there is very low information load. What does it mean? It means that there's few pieces of new information that are entering the system and that the agents can look at more things in their feed before they choose what to reshare. So in that case, this is an ideal case. You're not overwhelmed. You look at everything before you're deciding what to share. There is a high correlation between quality and popularity. Yay, the good stuff is going viral. But that's not very realistic, right? We all know we don't look at everything that is posted by our friends. There is no way. And so you look at a small portion. In that case, this is the scenario on the right. Um, either there is too much information out there or you just don't have enough attention to look at everything. 
And in that case, the correlation between quality and popularity is very low. So you see a lot of small nodes here. This means that these are users who are sharing junk. Despite the fact that they can tell and despite the fact that they prefer to share good stuff. Despite that, because of their limited attention, a lot of low credibility information, low quality stuff, junk goes viral in this scenario. The correlation is very low. So uh, that's from the sort of perspective of a model. Now, in this model, there was no notion of ranking. We were assuming that people saw things in chronological order. But we know the platforms actually rank things, right? And uh, typically, they use engagement to prioritize content that they predict will have high engagement. So what happens if we add this ingredient to the model? Now we say that the things that you see on your feed are ranked by an algorithm, okay? And we can assume that this algorithm has, is the platform, the platform has some way to measure quality and also has some measure to measure engage, some way to measure engagement. They can see how many people have shared something up to a point and they have many ways to assess quality. They know what are low credibility sources, they can look at diversity, etc. And in fact, they even changed their algorithm, both Twitter and Facebook, before the 2020 election to prioritize quality and deprioritize uh, engagement. And they reported that there was a lot lo less low credibility information spreading during the 2020 election. And then right after the election, they turned it back. Why? Because they said very openly they were losing money. Right? They were showing maybe good quality stuff, but it was less engaging. We were staying on the platform less, we were watching fewer ads, and they were making less money. So naturally, they went back to increase uh, engagement. So let's see what happens here on the x-axis. We imagine that we have a knob where the algorithm can give more weight to quality on the left or more weight to engagement on the right. On, the, uh, on this y-axis, you have attention, how many things people see on their feed before deciding something to share. And then on the z-axis, you have the average quality of information in the system. What you notice is that the more the algorithm has bias towards engagement or popularity, on average, the lower the quality. So the fact that the algorithm itself promotes highly engaging content leads to lower quality. Now there is an exception. You see that kind of yellowish ridge, okay? so. For a narrow value of the attention, a little bit of engagement bias helps. This is the wisdom of the crowds, right? In theory, this is why algorithm platforms do this, right? They say, well, you know, we use signals from users. If a lot of people like something, probably there's something good about it, so we should share it with others in principle. And yeah, under some circumstances, a little bit of engagement bias might help as, in, as this model predicts. But if you turn them up further, and you give high enough, you have high enough bias towards engagement, the quality will, will go down. And also that, that effect, the, uh, uh, you know, that ridge only happens for a narrow range uh, of attention. If people have just not, not too much, not too little attention. So in general, the platform themselves could also amplify the vulnerability. Okay, by the way, I mentioned that platforms have signals to assess quality. Um, let me just give you one example. This is some work that we did uh, recently. And uh, we looked at audience diversity and as, as a quality signal. It turns out that if you look at uh, news sources, if you look at the diversity of the audience, that has a good correlation with quality. Things that are either more on the conservative or liberal side tend to have um, uh, lower variance, but also uh, uh, lower, lower quality. And so if we modified the algorithm, the recommendation algorithm of the platform to add an ingredient of diversity of the audience without even looking at the content, just promote stuff that seems to be from sources that have a more diverse audience, actually uh, the quality uh, the trustworthiness of the information consumed by social media users increased, especially 
for some key groups, for example, the ones that have uh, more extreme information diets. For them, uh, the quality increased a lot. And for those that consume more, more quantity, more news. And also for the ones who visit more news sources. And also for the ones that uh, have a lo the lowest trustworthiness in their new feed, the ones that are exposed to more junk. If you help those people by increasing the diversity or favoring sources that have a higher diversity of audience, you will improve the quality. So this is an example of an ingredient that is available to platforms if they want to increase bias on quality and decrease bias on engagement. Okay, so that's from the point of view of the platform. What about us? Well, we are also affected by, um, by engagement, not just because, okay, uh, you know, it's engaging, so we're interested in it, but just knowing that other people like something makes us want to pay more attention. So this is a very obvious, uh, well-known cognitive bias, um, but if you need a little bit of a demonstration, we did an experiment with an app developed in our lab called Fakey. It's a game for news literacy. It's, it, it shows you a feed of news in something that looks like your Facebook feed or your Twitter feed. And some of them are from low credibility sources. Some of them are from highly credible sources. And you have to decide what to share or like or what to label or uh, flag for fact checking. And you get points for doing the right thing. So in the experiment, we manipulated one thing. That number that tells people how many people had liked or shared something. We made it up, okay, from a suitable distribution. And what, what happened? When players thought that that article had more engagement, that more people had liked it or shared it, they were more likely to share it or like it themselves, even if it was from a low credibility source. And again, for low credibility sources, people were more likely, sorry, less likely to fact check it if they thought that it was highly engaging, that other people had liked it. So just thinking that other people are paying attention to something makes you more vulnerable. I mean, think about it. If, you, if somebody shows you a YouTube video that has been watched by a hundred million times, you cannot resist the temptation, right? To watch it yourself. So this is a vulnerability and it can be exploited. It's kind of a vicious cycle. The algorithm, promotes things if the algorithm thinks that more people are paying attention. People are paying more attention if they think that other people are creating more attention. So all I have to do is create fake accounts to create the appearance that a lot of people are paying attention to something. And this way I can hack the system. One way to do that is to create automated accounts like social bots. We study those a lot in our lab. We've been doing it for many years. Uh, these are pictures of the very first social bot uh, retweet networks or mention network that we, we saw back in 2010. Uh, the, the ones on the left, those are the very first social bots that we discovered. We coined the term social bots for these accounts on the left. They were just retweeting each other tens of thousands of times promoting a particular politician. So we have a tool, uh, as Javier mentioned, that is quite popular, it's called Bodometer. You can use it yourself. And we can see it to study the role of automated accounts in amplifying misinformation. For example, this is a retweet network for uh, tweets that have links to low credibility sources in purple or fact checking sources in orange. And you can see a new type of homophily, a new type of echo chambers. The people who are more vulnerable to misinformation are more likely to follow others and retweet and interact with others who share more misinformation. And if you zoom towards the core of that misinformation network, you see a high, higher prevalence of suspicious accounts, accounts that are potentially inauthentic or automated. Um, let me skip a few things, but let me just mention that I talked about exploiting these uh, engagement vulnerability, one thing that you can do to do that is to flood the zone, right? And in fact, we see uh, the top right 
uh, uh, distribution is the distribution of the number of times that the same account shares the same link to the same fake news article. So you find a single account who might share a link to the same fake news articles thousands of times. That's what I mean by flooding. These are accounts that are created specifically to uh, amplify. Do they have an effect on humans? Well, one way to explore that is to look at retweets of low credibility sources. Okay, so here on the x-axis, you have the bot score of the accounts that is doing the retweet. On the y-axis, you have the bot score of the original account. And you can see the projection on the top shows you that most of the retweets are done by likely humans, accounts with low bot score. But then if you focus on those likely humans, who are they retweeting? And you can see that they retweet other humans, but they also retweet bots. So this is one way in which you can create fake accounts and you can use them to amplify misinformation because humans will reshare that content that they are exposed to by inauthentic accounts, just like we saw in the first plot with the Alex Jones uh, fake news. And then here is another trick that you can use if you want to hack this attention. If you want to flood the network, but you don't want to get caught by Twitter, for example. Twitter has a limit. You're only allowed to tweet 2,400 tweets per day. You might think, oh, that's too high. I mean, who needs to tweet 2,400, right? That's very high. Despite that, people want to tweet. Some bad actors want to cheat. And so what they can do is they can tweet stuff and then delete it after it has had some effect. So we actually studied deleted tweets at high volume. And we can find, so on the top plot that uh, there is a hard to see orange dashed line, all the dots are accounts that are above that line. That line represents 2,400 tweets. There are people who, so all those dots are accounts that have posted more than 2,400 tweets in a day and then deleted some of them so that they would not be caught by Twitter. Uh, and some, some accounts do this every day. So the bottom distribution show you the number of daily tweets. Again, the maximum is 2,400. And you can see that there are accounts that every day post uh, many tens of thousands of tweets in violation of the terms of service. And apparently they're not being taken down, so they're effective at uh, hiding their activities. Here's another trick that they do. One account will post something, and then a bunch of other accounts will like it and unlike it, like it and unlike it, hundreds of times in a very short time. And then the, the content gets deleted. So obviously those are ways to manipulate the algorithms, the trending algorithms, the ranking algorithms. It gets pushed, people see it. Once it has done its job, you can remove it. There is no trace of what you have done. This data, you cannot find it. You have to buy the compliance stream from Twitter in order to see all this deleted stuff. And it costs a lot of money. Now, before I finish, just briefly, let me say that this manipulation does not have to be done by automated accounts alone. They could be human operated accounts that look authentic if, and not, they don't look like bots. Here's an example of an account that if you look at it, it doesn't look like a bot. It looks like a politically active person. It's asking for money on behalf of anti-Trump campaign, but then, you might notice that there is a bunch of other accounts that are suspiciously similar. And uh, now you say, okay, there is something fishy here. And in fact, these are not authentic accounts. They're all, uh, they're all run by a human manually, but they're all controlled by a single actor. So we also use model to measure how much damage a bunch of coordinated accounts can do. So here you see in yellow, a bunch of accounts that want to push some misinformation on a community. And if they are pretty peripheral to the community, they cannot do much damage. But if they can infiltrate the community, if they get, get, can get humans to follow them, and then they post a lot of low credibility information, they can lower the quality of information in the system. The darker gray nodes, these are humans who are now sharing a lot of the low credibility information that comes from the uh, coordinated accounts. And we find lots and lots of examples. I don't have time to show you too many examples because I'm running out of time, but we see examples of these coordinated campaigns in all sorts of domains. We see them because they share handles. We see them because they retweet exactly the same accounts in the same sequences or they retweet the same tweets. 
they, re they use the same images, they tweet at the same time to do cryptocurrency fraud. Um, they can be controlled through an app. People may donate their accounts to a political group or people can be paid to uh, post content, copy and paste, copy pasta content as it has happened a lot during US elections. And so these are all ways in which you end up see, finding these big clusters of accounts that are clearly coordinated because their behaviors are almost identical. And we see that on Twitter and we also see that on Facebook. And so we build tools to try to detect these kind of coordinated behaviors. Uh, in this case, we detected this group of Russian bots immediately after they were created, they were trying to uh, promote a fake video attacking a particular target, a, a Putin uh, critic. And then within a few seconds, they were taken down by Twitter. So sometimes we don't even observe the activity of these, of these fake accounts. So just to conclude, we've seen that network community structure, complex contagion, echo chambers, limited attention, engagement bias, and her behavior all affect online virality, and that bad actors can exploit these vulnerabilities uh, to amplify misinformation and manipulate opinions. I want to say thank you to all my wonderful students and postdocs and collaborators in the lab. This is really their work. And uh, I also want to thank again uh, Springer Complexity for sponsoring this talk and remind you that EPJ Data Science uh, is a journal that uh, is a very good venue for publishing this kind of uh, research. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, awesome. Can I make this joke? Awesome talk. Um, enough. <laughs> Sorry. So I'm sure that there are a lot of questions uh, in the audience because there was a lot of uh, suggestive and inspiring materials. Please. No. But we cannot hear you. Yes. No. no. Oh, that's the yeah, I guess. <laughs> okay, we'll repeat, we'll repeat your question for Zoom. Yeah, I'm not sure that people at Zoom will, will appreciate your, your, your but streaming. I'll, I'll repeat it. Uh, okay, so in, in one part you mentioned that we're not enough to gain the quality and quantification. I'm just wondering if there's some sort of experience going on in which for you know what I say to start a meeting and the best. Uh mostly in the back, I mean it right from what we have is very exposed to certain types of names and why it's just one set of names that you're exposed to all of them, then quality might matter more. And the more practical side of this, oh, thank God. <laughs> The more practical side is that basically, if you lose money, uh, I mean, basically that for all, that's something that damages polarizing content during, it would be natural in a, during an election campaign, which is by nature a polarizing time. Uh, so it might not be the best data point to evaluate whether you win or lose money. Yeah. So yes, that's a very interesting question. So uh, it's about, uh, platforms, and I mentioned that platforms, uh, at least Facebook and Twitter, both declared that they uh, decreased the emphasis on engagement prior to the 2020 elections, and then they increased it again afterwards. And your point is that because elections are naturally polarizing events, that might not be the right time for them to evaluate whether that those kind of algorithmic choices are actually financially damaging to the company or not. That's a really great question. I. Uh, I, I, you know, I hope we can communicate that to the platforms and I will certainly bring that up if I have a chance. Um, I will say that there are studies that have shown at what happens when you present more diverse content, politically diverse content to politically active accounts. Uh, and uh, it, it, unfortunately, uh, the results suggest that they have the opposite result to what we hoped. If you 
if you expose conservative people to more liberal content or liberal co people to more conservative content, they tend to have the opposite reaction and become even more negative, more effectively polarized against that content. Um, there are theories, psychological theories for this, for example, the fact that they are already grounded in their own communities and they are aligned, so they tend to reject information that comes from the other side. Um, but there is a lot of work going on in trying to understand the dynamics of these echo chambers and how algorithms might be improved. So I think there is a lot of, th there are a lot of things that we still need to understand. Uh, yeah, good question. So I think we only have time for a, one more quick one. <laughs> let's, let's, let's diversify the spot. So maybe uh, Tito or There's two here. whoever gets it first. Okay, go I uh, yep. uh, was lucky. Uh, thank you for the talk, really interesting. Uh, it came to mind that looks like the platforms and the bots are having like kind of kind of evolutionary game to see who can get more engagement of the communities they want. Is any way to have kind of a study of these evolutionary um, strategies that they might be following? Because you have the data uh, through the different years and things like that, and you get the algorithms change and the bots change and all of that. Unfortunately, no, because we have no data about the algorithms. We have a lot of data about who posts online, and we have two machine learning tools like Botometer that can help us understand whether perhaps there is coordinated groups or inauthentic groups that are trying to game the algorithm. But we don't really know anything about the algorithm themselves because the platforms keep it secret. So we and many other researchers in this area have been trying to talk platforms into having more transparency. Of course, they don't want to reveal details about their algorithm, both for competitive reasons and also because they don't want that, to make it easier for bad actors to exploit their algorithms. However, there's a lot of discussion right now about possibly allowing some groups of vetted researchers to analyze that uh, data with some kind of collaboration with the platforms. Uh, right now, there is no systematic work in that direction. Occasionally, a platform will partner with some hand-selected researchers and give them access to research with very strict non-disclosure agreements so that researchers then are really very limited in what they can do. Um, but generally speaking, there is no way, uh, you know, in which we can explore those questions. Like, we don't know the algorithms has changed in this way on this date. There's no data uh, uh, that I know of that would allow us to do that kind of analysis. So hopefully with some collaborations from platforms, we could do more of that. Now platforms to some degree say that they want to be more open and more transparent and they have some initiatives like Twitter, for example, has a new set of APIs. Facebook has announced that they will open some data to researchers. Occasionally you have public you know, press releases from platforms like TikTok that say we will have an API, but then they don't necessarily follow up with that. So uh, it's, it's not an ideal situation because we are missing a lot of data. I think we don't have, uh, really, we don't have more time. Maybe in the coffee time, we can uh, have nice discussions. So please, let's thank again.